God allowed that. Okay, we can't just say because those guys were a bunch of wicked sinners. I bet some of them were believers that were killed. Okay, I bet probably a good portion of them may have been. We don't know. But all we know is that God is the one who is all sovereign, all in control, and nothing goes by him that he doesn't allow. The devil has to ask permission of God to do anything that the devil does. He gets permission. You can see it in the book of Job. Before Job was taken through the ringer, God gave him permission two times to do everything he gave to him to do. If you look at uh, King David with the census, before that happened, God gave permission to the devil, even sent him out to be the tempter, to give him a trial right there. Okay, God is behind all things. That's not to attribute sin to God. Sin is wickedness and is far from God, but yet it all goes through God's hands. And this lady's theory of God, when she told me that, and then later she told me some of her woes, I could see what was going on, is she is living on some kind of a premise of the here and now, and this is pretty much it. She's not looking into eternity. She's not looking into where God is. She is looking to where she is right now in her situation. And even though her situation was horrible and was bad, it's not right of us to try to twist God to make it fit so that everything fits and works out on our behalf or that we're the victim and we're the ones with all the, the problem and it's all our fault, okay? We, we can't do that. We can't take God out of the equation. And ultimately, by putting God in the sovereign place that the Bible puts him in constantly, and you think if he's God, then of course he is in control of all things. God has not lost control. He never has. He never will lose control. In fact, everything is going according to his plan, okay, through the history timeline, through Jesus Christ coming and dying for us. It's his plan, all right? This is the way that he planned to be. We hear about Jesus in Genesis 3.15 as the savior of the world before the curse even comes down to mankind in the earth, all right? It's been God's plan since forever, how everything is going to work out. And for us to try to say that we are capable of doing all these things that God doesn't even have a hand in or a touch in is really to make ourselves a Greek mythological God that only operates on our sense of fairness and our sense of things. If you read the Psalms, you read all these things, these hard times that David went through, hard times that people went through, they attributed it all to God. Read, read Psalm 88, where he says, the Lord, you kill me all day long. You bring this disaster and this pain upon me. Read some of these Psalms, and these Psalms are in the Bible because the Holy Spirit spoke through these men to put them in the Bible. It's not like we've got some Bible writers that didn't know what they were doing. It was God who was delivering these things to us. And what was the answer for all these guys is to trust in the Lord. Despite whatever may be going on, despite whatever trouble may be in your life, trust in Him. He's the one who allowed it, and he's also the one who will heal you. And in case he doesn't will to heal you on this side of heaven, he's the one who will take you into the kingdom that you'll be with forever, and you'll never have any of these issues anymore. In fact, all these issues will seem minor one day. And I guarantee you, when we do go to the other side and we see, well, God, why did you allow this and why did you allow that? We'll see with clarity why he did, and we'll think, well, of course that's why God did that. Of course that's why he did this, because he is in perfection. All right, He is not limited, and there's things that our finite minds cannot grab in the infinite realm. All right, But we can know that this was a horrible atrocity that happened, and man is capable of this much evil. All right, So what should we do? Despite all these things, these things that we can wear up, is we should pray for these people. And ultimately, it should cause people to turn back to God. It should cause them to think, God, look how frail life is. Look how everything can just fall apart that fast. And what do I have but you, O oh Lord? And this is where we should be in our lives as well. And we should be in prayer for those folks and their family members and everybody who is affected by this. Because some of those people, I guarantee you, there's some people wounded right now will probably never walk again. So in one way, that was the most horrible day of their lives last Sunday night when that thing happened. And in another way, that was a second chance to keep living and not lose their life. And I bet some of them will gather on that and respect that and be like, thank you, Lord, that I'm still alive. Even though I'm in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, thank you, Lord, that I'm not dead because, because it is all in God's hand. And we've got to be able to see it from the bigger picture Rather than, the, oh, what was me? What is this right here? And I'm going to make a quick fix on this by blaming the government or 
blaming guns or blaming people. People are desperately wicked. And this is the problem. And the answer is Jesus Christ. The more people we share the gospel with, the more people we teach about the Lord with, that we teach truth and we teach reality, that's where things are going to get better. Okay? The laws of the lands, they can constrain to a point. But it's only to a point. All right? God, when he comes in somebody's life and he changes them, that's a miracle. An absolute miracle. Everyone you here today that believes in Jesus Christ, you are a miracle walking. Amazing miracle walking, all right? Now, as we look over this chapter here, okay, that has a little something to do with where we're at because these Corinthians had a lot of pride and arrogance, okay? But but this is a current event I wanted to touch on base. The divisions over different ministers, okay? There's no ranking. They're still ranking everybody, you know, like it's Paul the greatest, it's Apollos the greatest, and we need to be careful we don't do the same. I mean, I have my favorite ministers myself that I listen to, but they are no different level than what I'm at or what you're at. We're all human beings. And you may think that some guy is so high and so mighty compared to God. He's not. Okay? We're all still human beings. And then if you look at 2 Timothy 3.16, that's the verse that says that all Scripture is inspired by God. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. And when that was wrote, probably most of the New Testament wasn't even known by most of those fellows. Okay? When Paul wrote 2 Timothy 3.16. But it's all wrote by God. And it says it's all good to preach and to help us to, to, to live a more righteous life. To help us to, to be corrected. And I wrote here that many are spiritually malnourished because they're missing whole counsel and are on unbalanced diets. Okay? I don't know how I prefer the method of preaching is I preach from one side of the book to the other side of the book. You know, for me, it's a wonderful method because I always know what I'm going to preach next week. Okay, I'm not trying to reach and try to grab for things. I'm not getting the same thing over and over again. Uh, I just think I've never, I think maybe two or three sermons, maybe for Christmas time or my testimony is the only thing I ever said twice. Everything else is new stuff every single week, both for me and for you. But for people who just pick and choose and try to avoid everything that's, that's negative in the Bible and only preach the fluffy stuff, that would be like us getting to go to eat all the time and getting some nice Buckeye pie. I had some this week. It's delicious. I don't know if you ever had Buckeye pie. It's delicious. But if you were only to go to eat Buckeye pie and that's all you ever ate because it tasted delicious, imagine what you would look like. You know, you'd probably be like 400 pounds. You'd be all malnourished. You wouldn't have any energy. Your brain wouldn't be working right. You'd have a horrible time, all right? And it's the same with the Word of God. We need to get... Every, we need to have our broccoli, maybe even our Brussels sprouts in there. Okay? <laughs> we need to have those things we don't like if we're going to be healthy and well nourished. All right, and that's why I wrote that many people today are malnourished, not because somebody's preaching a false gospel. There's a lot of churches that are not preaching false gospels, but they're picking and choosing in such a way. I wonder are they are they getting everything they need? Are they getting those broccolis, or are they only getting the uh, only get the yummy stuff, all right? And, and I, I promise you that I'll bring you everything. I want to bring you the yummy stuff too, man. I love that Buckeye pie. The fact that I got two pieces, because accidentally an extra pie piece came to the table, and they said, oh no. And the lady said, well, just give it to you. What do you want? It? I said, <laughs> maybe that's gluttony too. I don't know. I got to be careful, okay? I don't want to be preaching sitting here. But it did taste delicious, all right? So here, when we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards, stewards that one be found trustworthy. Now, some of you guys are business guys, okay? In fact, I know pretty much all you guys, so I know where you're at with different things. Some of you are hard workers, different stuff. Some of you guys have people working underneath you or work with other fellows that maybe aren't the same place where you're at. But the one key essential that people want in a worker is trustworthiness, okay? Like a, a good attitude and willing to be trustworthy. He's not going to lie to, the, to your company. He's not going to steal from your company. He's not going to lie to you. He may be uneducated. He may not have the skills the next guy has. He may have a whole lot of issues, but if he's trustworthy, you can work with him. 
You can work with them, you can teach them, you can build them up. It's an absolute essential in the Christian life and an absolute essential, I think, for any business in America. If you have somebody who's going to rob from you, that's not the kind of guy you want to have work for you, okay? You want to have trustworthiness. I saw a movie this week, so here off topic, but not too much. I was in a class that's about systems, and we were learning about systems and how we can help systems as chaplains. How we can go in and really help a system and get people to not just be there because they just want a paycheck and they, they hate life and they wake up and they're grumpy, and, but to help to give them a vision, help to give them a goal, help them own a piece of what they're doing for their work, that they can go forward and it'll be so much better in that environment and that system that they're working in if people aren't there just for the money, but they're there because of a passion, because of something in their heart. All right? And if you watch that movie, The Circle, man, that's a really twisted movie. All right? But really, in that movie, The Circle, there is no God picture at all. And in fact, their systems become so much perfected that they take over everything. And then you can see how poorly everything is if it's not built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Because then all kinds of bad stuff starts happening. It's like a mega communism movie by the time you see the end of it. But you can look at that movie and you can see some great things in the system and how like they they before someone came to work for them they wanted to know what her beliefs and her values were because it's going to be hard for them to instill that into her okay but if she comes with the beliefs and values and they give the vision she could really get on board and she did and she ended up being the one that I think actually went the wrong way. You can look at the Antichrist type way, but I think that movie, if you watch that movie, and then how crazy things get by the end. But that's because they were missing the rock of Jesus Christ. And I think in our world today, some people could watch that movie, The Circle, and think, wow, we're pretty close to this. This would be wonderful, because we could find all the missing people. We could find all the criminals. We could uh, make sure no one's ever kidnapped. We could make sure no crime is ever going to go on. But yet you completely lose your identity and everything about you, and you're really a slave to whoever it is that's in charge and is controlling the system. And if it's not Jesus Christ who you're, is, your, is, your, is your boss, is your master, then you are really in for some bad trouble, even worse than you were before. And if you look into communism, what we know about communism, really there is no difference whatsoever. Okay, The big guy's thumb is down on the little guy, and you never have any hope, no matter what, of stepping out from underneath that thumb. But if you go into a system type of thing, and Jesus Christ is your Lord, and the Bible is your, is your book that drives you, that gives you your boundaries, that's your life book, that gives you your right and your wrong standards, then that could be a beautiful thing right there, all right? But, but I got to that because at minimum, we need trustworthiness, okay? We've got to be trustworthy with each other, and we need to be trustworthy before the Lord. And it says here that good stewards are trustworthy, and we're supposed to be good stewards, servants of Christ, as well as the ministers. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. So, you know, they were in debate. Some of them probably didn't even follow Paul. They were following Apollos. They were following, someone said they were following Christ, which they shouldn't even put Paul and Apollos in there. And they were trying to examine Paul. And you know what Paul says? He says, it's a little thing for me to be examined by you. I mean, that probably made some of them mad. They probably thought, you know what? You think my opinion about you doesn't matter? He said, really, it doesn't. It's a little thing. In fact, I don't even examine myself, he says. And that's a good, healthy way. And we should be the same way, too. We don't examine ourselves by our own standards. We are examined. We allow the Holy Spirit to examine us through the Bible. When we read the Bible, that tells us who we are in Christ. That tells us who we are as a sinner. That tells us who we are, where we are in our spiritual life, as in the Bible not even our own selves. If we're just going off on a tangent, you know, kind of like that lady, I mean, she meant well that told me she doesn't think that God allows any kind of stuff, that it's all mankind's issues and things. I thought, well, you know, if that, that's a way if you're trying to put in a system, but it doesn't work theologically, it doesn't work in the Bible, and eventually it won't work in your life either if you try to hold to that, that thing that it's everybody else's problem, it's those kind of things, and you don't look at it as the big problem of sin and us that need to repent and follow the Lord and put our trust in Him. 
Alright? And I wrote, a minister must not allow himself to care about other people's evaluation. And I mean that in a very loving, gentle way, not in some kind of mean, vicious way or prideful, arrogant way, but in a very loving way. Because I tell you, I've had folks in the past tell me, well, I should do this, and I should do that, and I should say this, and I should say that. And really, those are good things. If you guys have something to tell me, I'd love to hear it. Okay? I do want to hear that. Okay? But understand that where I am going to go for my supreme examination is to the Word of God. And if I feel that the Bible is teaching this, if I can see this right here, that is what I'm going to do. Now, even maybe for my style of preaching. You can apply that in all different ways. But my style of preaching is expository from left to right through the books. Some may, people don't do that. Some people may not like that. Okay, I see that you don't get a good, well-nourished diet if you don't cover all those kind of things in the Bible. If you're only hitting the, the Buckeye pies, you're not going to be so healthy. Okay, And it's put in charge of me as a minister to feed you. And I can't just always feed you Buckeye pies, even though I'd love to. I'd love to eat some myself. But I can't do that. I've got to be responsible. So I have to make sure that God is the one evaluating me and He is my supreme authority. By all means, anybody anybody says anything to me ever for criticism, I take it to heart. I think about it. I dwell on it. I let it roll around inside of me. And I check myself against the Word. And I'm like, is this so? Is this something I didn't even see? And sometimes it is. Sometimes I need to repent and I need to move on too, just like everybody else does. But ultimately, we need to go to God, okay? For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. So Paul's saying he didn't know of anything going wrong with himself right here, but it didn't matter because it doesn't mean he's not guilty. It doesn't mean that he's not messed up, okay? If somebody's going to say, I'm the perfect guy, you know for sure they're not the perfect guy. You know, nobody is perfect, all right? And I wrote, we are all guilty, we are only justified by God and never by others. I mean, it's good to be in good fellowship and to be in uh, love with one another and different things, but they don't justify us, God justifies us. Think about King David. When King David sinned against that nice guy Uriah, stole his only wife, cheated on her, impregnated her, tried to trick him to sleep with his own wife so he would think that was his baby, and then sent him to the front lines to be killed in battle, okay? And then when Nathan the prophet called him out some months later on his sin, he didn't say, oh, let me go apologize to Bathsheba, let me go apologize to Uriah's family. He said, God against you only have I sinned. Read Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's apology, his repentance to God, and all these things. All right, yes, he did wrong a lot of other people. And should we try to make good with other folks? Sure we should. But the only one that it truly matters with is God. And I'm not saying that that you go and you think, well, I can treat anybody bad however I want, and I don't care if it's going to deal with God and me about it. That's a bad attitude, okay? But I'm saying you should have the importance that God is above every single thing else in your life, and he's the only one who can justify you. All right? You may have done somebody wrong, and you may make good with them, but you know what? God still be holding that against you, okay? Because he is the one, he says, every word you say, every thought you say will be counted against you on judgment day. That's a terrifying thing right there. Because every one of us, if we had, a, if we had our brain that could just, maybe one of these modern movies like that circle or something, and just, shoo, here it is, you see everything right there. We'd be ashamed of ourselves, probably. We'd be like, you know what? Like I said, I'm a sinner, okay? Like I said, I'm in desperate need of Christ is where we would be at. And who is the one who's going to hold us accountable for all these things? Is Jesus Christ. So he's the one that we should be going to for justification. It says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motive of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. All right. First Corinthians ten thirty one, which we'll get to in the you know two months or so maybe. It says, "Whatever we eat, drink, or do, it should all be to the glory of God." Everything we do. Notice a key a key part in this passage here that I would say is the motives, the motives of the men's hearts, the motives of our hearts. Okay, what is the motive? What's the motive we do what we do? What's the motive 
of why we're at work and why we're choosing to do this or choose to do that or how we are with our friends or our family or anybody, that motive is key, all right? And, if the, and I'll tell you how to fix it if you're thinking, well, I'm not sure about all my motives, is you can fix that by trying to make all your motives come under subjection to Christ. Well, if I'm going to do this, is this going to bring God glory? Is this the way God would want me to treat my neighbor? Is this the way God would want me to follow after him? Is this the way God would want me to uh, be in a good relationship or a good marriage or different things like this? This is where, where the, the real answer and the healing and things come is what is our motive, all right? Think about that crazy Vegas shooter. Seems like the biggest question is, is what was the man's motive? What was his motive? I tell you, I don't know his motive either. I'd like to find out what caused man to do such a crazy thing. But I know one thing, that it wasn't to please God. There's no way that that man could have ever thought he's pleasing God by shooting all these people and taking their lives and committing mass murder as he did. That motive was a horrible motive, whatever it was. You don't know what it is, but it was definitely not this motive of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. If we're following this motive right here, Think about how much safer that makes for us. When we're walking down the road and we have a left and right boundary of a sidewalk and maybe we have a dangerous pearl road on one side of us, maybe if we'd been drinking or something and we started stumbling left, that could be it. A car could run us right down right there, okay? But if we have the guidelines and the boundaries of trying to have a good motive toward God and everything we do in life, it's not going to be so bad, all right? And I'll tell you, I'm not trying to preach health and wealth, but life does get better for a lot of people who are in deep sin when they come to Christ because they're no longer, because now they have a standard. Now they have a boundary. Now they have a, a way of life to follow rather than missing everything. When they say if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You'll never hit the mark, okay? You hit that every time. And the better saying I like to say is you aim small, you miss small. So if we aim at pleasing God, we're not going to miss so bad left and right. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Okay, so he's basically telling them, stop ranking each other. Quit thinking that this guy's better than this guy, this lady's better than this lady. Quit ranking each other and look to Jesus and the Bible. All right? And don't be arrogant about it. You know, don't be prideful about it. Pride's what really gets us. It says, For who regards you as a superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Think about this. There is not one thing you have in life that didn't come from God. Like I said, if you have a God like I have a God, that you read the Bible, that He owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That He is everywhere at every single moment. That He is not, is nowhere you can run away from God. That He is all sovereign. There is not one thing you have in life that He did not give you. The breath you breathe today, the body that you have, the cells and the way that they work, the thoughts that you have, the the the. The good things that you have, okay? All these things, God is the one who gave it to you. We received everything. There isn't anything. Even things that other people did for us. Somebody else may bless you, give you some gift card, or, or buy you a piece of Buckeye pie, or whatever they may do. And that's a blessing. But did, did, you, did you make it? You received it from somebody, okay? Even if you worked hard for the money, who made you able to be able to work hard for that money? God gave it to you. You received it as a gift from God that you're able to have the intelligence to be able to get out and work, to be able to do what you have to do, the physical ability to be able to breathe the breath of different things. So we need to be careful not to regard ourselves as superior to anybody, okay? We shouldn't look at ourselves as superior. We should look to the Lord and realize it's His divine providence. You know, it says in Romans 8, 28, that for the believer, God uses all things, even the evil things, for good. So even if something bad happens to you or I, God's going to use that for good. And you can be blessed by it. You can know that when you're on the trail, you're on the sidewalk walking after God. Say God's like down there by Medina Square. It's a little bit of a walk, all right? Let's hope we all got a little bit of a walk. We don't know. We've got whatever God appoints us to have. Okay? And you're walking down toward Medina Square. Bad stuff may happen to you on the way, but you can be assured that God's going to get you down to Medina Square. 
You're going to get there one way or another. And he's going to use whatever bad stuff happened to you for good for you on the way. Now, it may not feel good if somebody jumps out and mugs you and hits you or something that does some bad stuff to you. But you better believe God's going to heal you up and God's going to keep you going on down that path toward, toward Medina Square, back toward the kingdom of heaven. Because he only has good for those who love him. Him. Now, I can't say that for everybody. For the lost guy that's walking the wrong direction, can't say he's ever going to go in the right place. I can't say any good's ever going to happen to him. He's got common grace that he's still alive. But for those who are believers, we know that all these things we receive are for our good. Even if at times it's like a Brussels sprout. Like, oh, I don't want that. Okay? <laughs> all right? I don't like Brussels sprouts at all. All right. You are already filled you have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you would become kings so that we also might reign with you. So he's letting them know, like, hey, you guys are already rich. You've got all kinds of things and everything. All right? But what they have to realize is that everything we have is on loan from God, and it's just for a while. Okay? Even our lives, it's just on loan. It's not that we own our own life. Okay? God owns us. God made us. Do you think that you would exist if God didn't make you? I, I there's, a, there's a lady I know, and she's preaching John chapter 3 today, and it's one of her first preaching times, and I talked, she asked what to do and what to say, and I said, I said, well, point out that when you're talking about being born again, when you're born again physically, do you think that you had anything to do with being made? Your mom and dad had something to do with you being made, but you didn't have anything to do with it. When you're born again spiritually, you also don't have anything to do with how you were born again, okay? And that's a concept you don't hear a lot. You will hear from guys like me that are big sovereign of guys, guys, God, God guys, because God chose you and God saved you at just the right moment in the right place in your life, and he brought you to who you are, and it was a divine birth. If you had something to do with it, it wasn't a divine birth. Now, a lot of people, I think, have these divine births and they attribute it to themselves in arrogance, but they still have the divine birth, though. They're still saved and born again, but they just haven't really come to the fullness of that concept that God is the one that saved them, okay? Everything we have in life is from God and it's just on loan. It's only on loan. Nothing's going to last forever. Even our cars, we've got some nice cars out there, different things. They're not going to last forever, okay? Even the guys can take care of their cars perfectly. I don't know if they would get 20 years out of driving a car on these streets and things over 20 years, okay? And it'll be passed. Everything has a time. It comes and it goes away, and it's all on loan, and it ultimately, it all goes back to God. And it's so dangerous to let pride try to have things like, well, this is mine, and I'm always going to have this and have that. That's a bad attitude. In fact, I remember what Job said. When Job was talking, after all 10 of his kids were killed and all kinds of horrible stuff happened, that God allowed, that he gave Satan permission, even offered Satan to do all these things to Job and gave him the authority to do so to Job, Job said, the things that I feared the worst have come upon me. Now that's a terrifying thing, because we can all think about some things that we would fear the worst and probably be with family with different things, but that just kind of shows that, you know what, we've got to keep our trust completely in God. If something horrible like that happens to us, I hope I could be like Job. At the end of the day, say, you know, shall I expect to receive good from God and not evil as well? You know, he says in 8.28 that he'll use the evil and the good to help us right there. So there's going to be some bad times right there that come down to every single one of us. But do we go to that saying that God is enough, that I can trust in him, that no matter what happens, I have got him. And you read the books, like I said, you read Psalm 88, man, that's a hard psalm to read. It doesn't even have a positive ending at all like a lot of the Lament Psalms have in the Bible. It's negative beginning, negative ending. But it's how somebody felt with how horrible life had become for them. And it was a believer, too. It wasn't some non-believer that wrote Psalm 88, okay? But at the end of the day, the answer is to trust in God. God, God may crush our pride in such horrible ways. I, don't, I would rather... Learn the easy way and not the hard way. Now, I have to admit, usually I do learn the hard way, okay? And I don't know about you, that's just the kind of guy I am. That's a bad thing, maybe, is I usually have to go the long, hard way before I learn. But it's so much better if we can learn the easier way. If we can read it and we choose to believe it and we submit to it and we follow after God, so much better than God having to put that crushing hand down upon us to make us aware of what the truth is. 
says, For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. All right? So he's basically saying we've been brought into the arena world to die as criminals before the world. Now, these are the apostles. Now, today's TV ministries and different things, a lot of them make you think, well, if you follow God, you're going to be blessed, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy, you have enough faith, you give us enough money, everything's going to be great. These were the apostles. These were God's chosen men to go out there to speak on behalf of Christ. What they said were the words of God when they spoke. They spoke on behalf of God Almighty, and God endowed them with this ability to, to write the scriptures and to speak on behalf of Him. And how were they treated in this world? It says they were made a spectacle to all, okay? Some of them were thrown in the arena for wild animals to tear them apart. Some of them were executed before the crowds and before everybody. And it says before angels and to men. Don't think that the angels weren't watching as well, okay? There's angels all around us. The Bible talks about guardian angels. It talks about they're messengers of the Lord. And they're big and they're mighty and strong. They're not some fluffy-looking little pretty girl that looks like a baby that's flying around. You don't see that in the Bible, okay? But these angels are wonderful beings because they're God's, God's men, God's guardsmen, God's, God's, uh, God's men to be, and be around us to protect us and watch over us. And yet they watched and they didn't do anything. Because Jesus said even when he was on the cross, he could call and have legions of angels come down, take him down and just wipe everybody out. You know, But he didn't. All right? God's got a purpose. What is that purpose? We don't always know that purpose. But we've got to be able to trust Him that He does know, because He's infinite. We're just finite. We've got to submit and trust in the Lord. These Corinthians were getting getting carried away with arrogance. They were getting carried away on pride. That's why they're getting a talk like this from Paul. It says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. Now this is like sarcasm right here. This is... Uh, this is really kind of hitting them because here's the apostles and he's sit, and they're doing their best to follow after God. They've been endowed with this mission and yet he's saying you guys have it so good and we have it so bad. You guys are so smart and we're so weak. We're so foolish. You're so strong. Look at where we are. All right, This should have been like an eye opener to these guys. We're like, wow, you know, this doesn't seem to fit the way we want things to fit to, to go into our, our Greek mythology way of making our gods ultimately be about us being a God, all right? The Corinthians had the wrong perception of themselves. They were holding the worldly perception. Think about this. How many of us in our day, we get some degrees, you get to call, be called doctor or called this or called that, and, and you try to use that to value yourself. How many of us, even when we meet somebody else, not long after we meet them, we're like, well, what do you do? What do you do for a living? And we judge them right away from what they do for a living and we really don't know the person whatsoever. All right, these are all man-made things. In Christ, all that stuff doesn't really matter. What matters is are you a believer? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Where are you with the Lord today? Are you my fellow brother? Are you my fellow sister? It doesn't matter if you're a, a person that uh, maybe uh, does, does something like clean toilets in some filthy place or something, or a person that works on Wall Street and a billionaire or something like that. It doesn't matter. Who are you in Christ today? And that's what matters. When we get caught up and hung up on all these titles and names and different things, it's a dishonor to Christ. And it's not the way it should be. Because like I said, even if you call somebody the Pope, you think the Pope is more Christian than you're Christian? No, okay? Do you think he can get to a higher level than you can get? No, because before God, we are all mankind. And nobody in mankind is going to be above somebody else in mankind. We may try to put people above and below in things. God doesn't do that. In fact, God says in the Bible that he'll use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And how many guys you read about in the Old Testament that were like a nobody, and God made them a somebody. And it wasn't chosen. Like King David, he was just like Cinderella. When they were looking for who was the person that danced in Cinderella, they never thought it was the servant girl that was up in the attic doing those things, all right? They never thought that kind of stuff. They didn't want to think about that kind of stuff. But that's the way God does things as well. He doesn't work on our system. He works on His system. His system's in the Word of God. 
And like I said, as we try to, for me, as I'm studying systems and working on how I can be the best in the system and help that system, ultimately, I have always got to be, remain tethered to the Bible, remain remain driven underneath the Bible because if I step out of the Word of God and I step away from Him, I am only going to step into my own destruction is where I'm going to step. To this world, they may think, well, that sure is a smart choice, so that's a great thing. If I go against God, I have done wrong, and that could be horrible for me. I don't want to do that. i got to stay there, and I hope that you want to stay there as well. So don't let this world judge you. Don't let them put you in some kind of an eye up or above or below. Paul didn't. Paul didn't let them do that to him. He said, only God examines me. Okay, God is my judge. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. So this is the apostles. Look at this. They're hungry. They were thirsty. They didn't have good clothes at all. They got treated real bad and they were homeless. We read through the whole book of Acts. Man, Paul went through some serious beatings, all kinds of horrible stuff. And yet he was, to me, he was the greatest apostle of the apostles. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. He did amazing things. He brought the gospel out into the world in a way that nobody else had to that point in time. And yet, look at look at his condition right here, okay? So this health and wealth gospel stuff, throw it to, throw it to the trash where it belongs because it's not the Christian gospel. Now, if God does bless you with health and wealth, and I hope that he does, praise God. But if he doesn't, don't think it's because you don't have enough faith or because you're not being the way you ought to be before God, okay? That, that could have nothing to do with that whatsoever. Here it says, And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. So this is how they are. This is, I tell you, this is the kind of worker, if I was going to hire a worker and I found this out about him, that, you know, how bad things are off, but yet he's trustworthy, and even all these bad things here happen to him, he's hungry, thirsty, poor, cold, homeless, Yet he still works really hard, yet he doesn't give up. Yet when people strike at him and say evil, awful things about him, he blesses those people. When, when people try to hurt him and persecute him, he keeps enduring and he doesn't give up and he doesn't crumple under that thing. It's amazing. I mean, I talk about that as like what we'd want as a worker, but think about it as a servant before God. I think that's a beautiful way to picture if we God is basically telling us here, how can we be a good servant of Jesus Christ? That we're able to, to toil. That we're able to go through the hard times. That we're able, that when people say bad things about us, that we can still bless those people. Okay? That when we're persecuted, we can endure. All right? Lately, I've been having to sit through some things, and I've been learning a lot of my own life, where I can sit by somebody who is on a different political side than me, a different religious side for me, and they can tell me things that just make me cringe inside. And you know what? At first I thought I was somebody special because I didn't say anything back to them. But then I realized that's shallow too. Because if I'm going to be a minister of the Lord and I'm to help that person, and I'm only using all my strength to just keep my mouth shut, that doesn't help me so much. It doesn't help them so much. I'm not being a good servant to Jesus Christ. But if I'm able to get all this stuff blasted against me, and I'm able to still just set that aside with not, with not a lot of resistance, where it's taking up everything in me, and still think, well, what does this person really need in life? Where are they right now, and how can I help them? Where are they spiritually? What is it that's got them in such a tizzy that they've got to crush me so bad when we first meet each other? And, and how, what made them like this? How can I go in and talk to them and be the loving neighbor that God commands me to be, to love this person despite what they say to me, despite how they intentionally hurt me? I bet a lot of them know that this is probably where I am, and they purposely do these kind of things. But if I were to just lash back, it would be no good. In fact, I learned something this week too. I learned some things. If I was to grab one of your hands, maybe you could try it with each other, or try it with somebody else because you didn't know what it is now, but grab one of your hands and pull, the automatic response would be you would pull back. That's the automatic, natural, human response. Now, if I was to grab your hand, and you grabbed mine, and you pulled, and I came into you, you would probably let come, come toward me as well. Maybe we would hug, and we would be together. But the natural inclination of man, because of our sin nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve, is to pull apart. 
Okay, so like when I meet these people and they hit me up with all this stuff, you know, you know I'm a big gun guy too. Some guy this week was telling me how awful guns are, so that I had to just zip it, listen to him, and try to help him right where he was. And I didn't let that phase me a bit. I didn't have to explain things or defend things to him. And I've had it with Christianity too. I had some lady tell me how the Trinity isn't real, how the Bible isn't real. You know how hard it was for me to sit there and still minister to her? But I am learning that all that doesn't matter. It's a sad condition when the people, you know, for the other stuff, who knows where things are for sure, okay? But with God, we know for sure where things are. When they go against God and they go against us and it's hard on us, how do we react? Do we just like, I'm out of here? Or do we want to try to help them? Do we want to love them? Do we want to bless them? Do we want to find out what is it in their life that's causing them so much pain, so many troubles, that's making them be like this with everybody, making them be what they call a toxic person, all right? Does anybody gonna love the toxic person? Well, naturally, we're all gonna pull away from them, but if we're believers, we wanna pull toward them. I had to watch another movie. I tell you, some of these movies, I don't know why I had to watch them, but this is how this college works things. But I had to watch this movie called The Mona Lisa Smile. And in this movie, it's about this special girl prep school in uh, the 50s or something, and. Uh, and all the girls are being raised to pretty much be good wives and want laundry machines and all those kind of things. And, and there's this one girl who gets everything the school said that would be good. And she gets married to this guy that comes from a wealthy family. She's in a wealthy family. And she's always trying to make life hard on all the rest of the girls saying, this is the model. This is the cookie cutter picture you all need to have. And then this one girl starts talking who isn't, who's having a very bad time with love, who's having a, been a, pretty much abused and a lot of terrible relationships, and this girl starts calling her the worst of words, cutting her down before everybody else, and this girl, they showed in the movie, the night before had looked out the window and saw that this other girl who was cutting everybody else down, her husband was cheating on her with somebody else, and she was the one who acted all Miss Perfect and Mitch miss everything and you know what right in the movie they made you think you know she's going to tell her she's going to say well i saw your husband with another woman last night instead she comes up to her and you think she's about to really attack and she grabs her in the midst of her pain and hugs her and then she this girl just starts breaking down in tears because she knew what was going on with her husband she could sense all this trouble was going on and you could see healing go on and how many times in life are we willing to step aside and let our Things that are very important to us, set those aside and help that other person. Because that's the way the Bible points things out. We're to set ourselves aside and love the other person. We're not supposed to be attacked. We're not supposed to be causing all this trouble. And that's not a natural way. The only way you're going to be able to do that is if the Holy Spirit is guiding you, convicting you, giving you the strength. And I'll tell you, when you're on that walk, down the sidewalk toward Medina, or picture down the sidewalk toward heaven right there, You've got the power of the Holy Spirit. You can do these kind of things. So we should try to do these kind of things and reach and be together. So when they persecute, we can endure. When they revile us, we can bless them. And that's what's going to really stick out to people. Because everybody's kind of nice to each other. Everybody's kind of a good person. But it's those kind of things that are above and beyond that Christianity should give you the strength to do. When we are slandered, we try not to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. So to the world, Paul and the rest of the apostles were scum, the dregs of the earth, the scum of the earth. They weren't some high respected Pharisee on high that did all these things and walked around in fancy robes. They were dirtbags. They were scum. They were the dregs. If they walked into some places, I bet it was like, oh boy, not this guy. Oh, what kind of stuff are we going to have to deal with? And yet, he still went anyways. And look what he says. He goes, we try to conciliate when we're slandered. Yeah, sometimes it's hard not to say something back. But he tries to conciliate. And that's the same way we should be too. Somebody says something evil to us, it's going to take some... At first, it might take everything you got just not to open up your mouth and let it go forward. But then as you think about it, like I thought about it, well, what good am I to that person just not saying something? I've got to go beyond that. I've got to be able to set that aside. I've got to be the mature one like an adult where if one kid calls another kid a, a crazy name, you know, the adult would be like, I don't really care what you called me, but I'm going to come over here and help you and get you up and get you in the right direction. Okay, that's the way we've got to be as Christians. We can't return 
tit for tat. We can't look. What did Jesus say? He goes, it's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Now that's scripture, okay? And the way that I interpret that, and I believe other people interpret that, is because it's not up to the individual to do justice for justice. Okay? God ordained the government for that. Talking about Romans 13, it says they don't bear the sword in vain. We've got to have some kind of justice system. We'll have criminals all over the place. But not every one of us, we're not all vigilantes. We're not out there because somebody did us wrong, I'm going to do them wrong. I'm going to, because somebody did this, I'm going to fix it right here. That's not the Christian point. The Christian point is that person did me wrong, and yes, you should tell the justice system they get in trouble or something, but in the meantime, you love that person. You forgive that person. And you go that extra mile for that person. That's the Christian picture right there, all right? And people in the world don't like that. They're going to think you're a fool, but this is the biblical way. And we can't be tied to this world. Our eyes are on eternity, and our value comes from God. Where do we get our values from? We should get them from the Bible. We don't pick them up from the outside world because they'll be tainted. We've got to pick them up in the Bible, all right? I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Now, isn't this a beautiful part? Here toward the end, he just kind of like kicked these guys all over the place. I hope you don't feel like I kicked you all over the place, all right? That's pretty scripture, okay? I didn't point to you. I may look at you because i got to look at you guys, all right? Not looking at you specifically, I promise. But, but look at this. After he did all these things, he said, I don't want to shame you, though. I want to admonish you as my beloved children. This word beloved is one of the most precious most loving type of words in the entire Bible, beloved. And now he tells them, after after they were talking bad about him and looking at him as the drugs and the dregs and the scum of the earth, as they were looking at him as the nobody and they were the somebody, he says, but you're my beloved children. I love you. You're my beloved, okay? Because they were brothers and sisters in Christ. And they weren't obedient. They weren't morally upright. We're going to keep reading more things about these Corinthians. They weren't doctrinally sound. They had messed up doctrine. They were not mature. But they were loved. And I tell you what, every one of you right now today, no matter where you are in your Christian walk, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are loved. And that's a beautiful thing. At the end of the day, even if you're like, oh man, did I take a hard beating on that sidewalk today? I, but I know that the king down there, he loves me and I'm something special to him. And he died for me and he cares for me and he's never going to let me go. And I may know that no matter how bad things are for me right now, his eye is on me right now. He's watching me. He's with me. And he loves me. And he does care for me. That's something that we can always hold on to. And that's something that should give us that inner strength, especially in those times when we don't feel like we have anything within us. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Now this isn't going to say like the Catholics say, they call everybody father and uh, some hardline evangelicals, some guys that I know, who are very upset with that. And in Matthew 23, 9, Jesus said, you're not supposed to call anybody your father, but God alone your father, you know. For me, I would be, it might be like somebody trying to call me a priest, I'd be like, don't you dare call me father. I am not your father. Look, at God is your father, okay? And that would be a thing. But as you even see here, he tells them that he's their father. But you know what? Nowhere in history do we ask somebody uh, historically calling Paul Father Paul, all right? So we can take things out of context and then try to put names and things to ourselves, and that's a bad thing. But that's not what Paul's doing here. He's not trying to say, well, you better call me your father because he goes, I fathered you through the gospel, and we may have many tutors, but we only have so many fathers. He's letting them know how much he loves them. He's letting them know how much he cares for them. And in the same way that God cares for us and God is our father, He's looking at that as all those who he has raised in the faith, all those, he's, all those he's responsible for preaching the Bible to, that he is like their father, all right? And he loves them as well, all right? So he's not the source, but Paul is the tool that God is using, all right? And what does a father do? He sticks by you. A good dad, no matter what you did, will stay by you, you know? Whether your kids do some horrible, awful stuff, even if they go to the prison and whatnot, they're still your kids and you still love them because you're their father, because, because that's your kid right there. And he's letting them know, these Corinthians who have done all kinds of horrible things, he's like, I'm still your father. I still love you. I'm still here for you, all right? And I'm still, still right here. And before, he just told them how loved they are by God, even though all these other things are wrong with them. They're still loved. 
It says, therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. So he's letting them know. It's like real empathy. He's like down in the pit with them. And he's saying, you know what? I know you're all messed up, but you know what? God loves you so much. I look at you as my own children. I father you. And by the way, please, I exhort you. I encourage you. Kind of be like the way I am. Walk the way I'm walking. And in order to say this, Paul had to be walking the right walk. You couldn't have a preacher who is out there with a bunch of ladies when he's married or something, or misusing a bunch of money, or doing drugs and different things, and him say, be imitators of me, because you know you, that would not do you any good at all, okay? You need to have a preacher or a leader who is living a model Christian life. Now, if you look at any preacher, including myself, it won't take long until you'll find some faults, you'll find some sin, you'll find some personal issues. Because we're all still human beings too. Even Paul, there was some kind of personal issue going on with Paul, and I guarantee it. All right? But there is a difference between struggling against sin, and I'm in this fight, I'm trying to make my way down that sidewalk, okay? And just kicking back in the bushes, being like, oh, I don't care, I'll do whatever I want to do here. Or, or even starting to walk the other way, okay? There's a big difference between embracing sin and struggling against sin. And I promise you, I struggle against sin, and I will continue. And if you see me not struggling, tell me about it, okay? Please tell me about <coughs> privately. I don't want to, you know, unless I don't listen to you, then you got to tell me about personally. But tell me about it, because I do want to be somebody you can imitate, that you can follow after, and not so you can be like me, but so you can be like Christ, okay? There's always going to be some things you're going to be like, you know what, Buck's a little like this. I have no reason to be like that. I don't have an interest in that. But in the ways that I'm like Christ, please be like that, okay? For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. So he cared for them so much, he made sure that they had somebody good to take care of. He sent them Timothy. Timothy goes on to be their pastor and stay there for a while, all right? And... Galatians 6 1, people all the time are, you know, use, they actually say now, they used to say the second most known Bible verse in the whole Bible was Matthew 7 1 after John 3 16, which says, Judge not lest ye be judged. But if you look at Matthew 7 5, it talks about judging others. It says, Once you get the plank out of your own eye, then you can gently help your brother with the problem that he has, okay? But if you, but people will distort that. That's the only thing they know, and they pull things out of context like cults and different things do. But if you look at Galatians 6.1, it actually tells you, as a Christian, to go to the other believers who are messed up, and it says to restore them gently. So don't kick them in the teeth when they're down, but be gentle about it. Let them know, hey, you know, you're really missing the track. You are really, you're going the wrong way on the sidewalk, man. Come on, go back this way with me on the sidewalk. It says restore them gently, all right? And this is what Paul is doing now. He kind of was rough on these guys a bit. Then he told them how loved they were. He told them how he was their father. He looks at the situation. He told them how, I'm going to make sure that Timothy comes and he takes good care of you and helps you on this path. He restored them gently. And then he says, Now some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. And it says in the Bible, it talks about the, the seven deadly sins that God hates. And pride is one of those sins. Okay, And I believe pride is probably one of the sins that God hates the most. Because if you look at the Bible, what sin was Satan guilty of? If you look at Isaiah 14, it was the sin of pride. He said, I will be like God. What sin made Eve eat that fruit when she heard you can be like God and know good and evil? Pride can destroy every single one of us. It's one of those things that if you say, if you say, do you have a problem with pride? You say, no, that guy just lied to you. Or that lady just lied to you, okay? Because we all have to fight pride all the time. Pride will come up on every one of us all the time. It's something always, it's like that lion that uh, God told Cain. He said, he said, be careful because sin is crouching at your door like a lion, ready to pounce on you. In the next verse, he, kill, he kills his brother. All right, so he didn't, he wasn't careful. He was even warned by God, but that's the way pride is. It's crouching right there for every one of us. It says, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. And I put the question here, where do you draw your power from? 
Are you drawing your power from the world, this broken system that's going to just fall flat on its face before you know it? Our culture will no longer be the culture it is 20 years from now. It'll be a totally different culture. Our culture's not the way it was 20 years ago. This world's cultures are worthless. They are temporary. They are minute in the eyes of God, and they're not going to save you. They won't keep you. It's like building your house on that sand with no foundation at all. But if you've got your house built on this kingdom of God, on that foundation, on that rock of Jesus Christ and his Bible, nothing's ever going to be able to shake you. All right? And where he's talking about power. Where do you draw your power from? And hopefully you draw your power from God. In the last verse today, what do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Now, is it Paul saying he's going to show up with a rod and just whoop the daylights out of these guys? <laughs> I don't think so, all right? He's not saying he's coming in with a steel rod of reed bar. He's just going, <laughs> it would be horrible. Could you imagine, like, quick eye to kids? He's gone nuts, all right? He's not talking about that, but he's talking about with words. Does he have to come and give them a, a good talking to? Is he going to have to give them a good lashing at with the words? Or is he going to come with love and a spirit of gentleness? All right, this is the way he's talking about. He's not coming and talking in about beating everybody with a rod, okay? I don't think so at all. He's talking about, just like he's been writing this letter back and forth, we saw harsh stuff, then we saw love stuff, all right? And he's saying, when I come to you, what am I going to find? Am I going to be able to be love and gentleness to you, or am I going to have to really, you know, lay it to you and give you a good talking to? It says in the Bible that a good father disciplines his children. All right, this doesn't mean that you abuse your children, break their arms and damage them and mess them all up. What it means is when your kid's doing wrong, you gotta be bold enough to confront your kid and do something about it. You know, you gotta be able to take something away from them. You gotta be able to, the thing they love the most in life, you have to pull that away from them. Unless it's Jesus Christ, that's a beautiful thing. Don't ever pull Jesus Christ from your kid. But, but you may have to do the hard things because you love your kid and you don't want him to turn out to be a whole messed up kid. You know, you don't want to shelter him so much. Another fellow this week, he told me that his kid was fine. He sent him off to college. He had a mental breakdown. And now, like eight years later, he has to babysit this kid, like, uh, all the time. He has a psychotic break. He's schizophrenic now. And him is always has to be someone 100% of the time around this kid. And he was really beating himself up hard about it. I don't think it was this guy's fault as much as it's just the broken, sinful world that we live in. But one of the things he said is he said, you know, I spoiled him. I gave him everything he ever wanted and this and that. Maybe I didn't prepare him. Then when I sent him off to college and he had all this break and all this stuff happen, and now we, we had years of counseling, me and my wife, and years of pain, he said, and they blamed themselves so much. But I don't think it was so much all that. But I do think that as good parents, we do have to discipline our kids. We've got to guide them. We see them messed up, we got to say, hey, that is really messed up. You don't need to do that. You need to fix that. You know, we've got to guide them in the right direction, or basically, we've done child abuse because they're going to go out and go anywhere. Almost like how I said, if you're only getting a diet of Buckeye pie, and then these Christian guys are clueless when they're out in the world amongst other Christians, and they're saying the dumbest things and doing the dumbest things, well, who did that to them? Their father who never taught them. Their preacher who never led them. Who never gave them the right type of words. Who never taught them any doctrine. But when the winds blew in life and they just fell over the place because they had no strength, because they had no real meat, because they didn't have good nutrition on the Bible. Yet, as a good father, we've got to discipline our children. And I'll tell you what, for sure God disciplines us. I don't think there's any of us that could look at our lives as a Christian walk and think that God never disciplined me. God does discipline us. You know, maybe look on your life. Look on things that have happened in your life. Look at different situations. And I guarantee you, when you look at the hardest times in your life, you'll also find the biggest spiritual growth in your life. Especially if you're sitting here today. That means you've been through some times. You're not, not here today. All right? I'm not saying everybody not here is like that, but some people are. I've never in any church. But if you come this far in your Christian walk, it's because you've been through discipline. You've been through tough times. You've grown, and God has done something within you to make you a better Christian. All right, And it's the same way we've got to do with our children. And we've got to ask ourselves this. We should ask ourselves this every day. What do we desire? All right, And our biggest desire of all things should be to be with Jesus Christ forever in the kingdom of heaven. Forever. 
All right. If all of a sudden you found out today that you're going to die tomorrow, 